Say you want to solve a differential equation in a very complicated geometry, for example, this potato-shaped waveguide, and you want to calculate the fields using Maxwell's equations. Now, obviously, in a complicated geometry like this, it will not be possible to solve the equations analytically. So this is why we don't go for calculating the fields everywhere in the continuous space that this waveguide is situated in. Rather, we're going to make sort of like a sacrifice and only calculate the fields at certain given points in space. So we're going to have some sort of a grid overlaid on our structure. And rather than calculating the fields everywhere, we're going to calculate the fields only at these grid points or at these, these mesh points. So typically people use a square or a rectangular uh, mesh. Now, obviously, a very important parameter here is the distance between two grid points, between two mesh points, and that is the so-called grid size, the mesh size. Obviously, the smaller you will make this number, the more accurate your approximation will be. Makes sense, right? Uh, but obviously, the, the price you pay for that is increased computational resources. Either the computation will take longer or will consume more memory or typically uh, both. So that's typically a trade-off you need to be aware of when you're making these types of, uh, of approximations. Now, our differential equation obviously will contain derivatives, for example, uh, df dx. And what we now want to do is construct an approximation of this derivative, which is operating in the continuous space, to something which only involves information of the fields of the function f on these grid points. So we're going from a continuous situation to a discrete uh, situation. And this is behind the so-called finite difference approximations of uh, the derivatives, which we're going to derive in this, uh, this video. Now, as a starting point, I suggest you pause the video and you write down a Taylor series for the field at a neighboring grid point x plus dx, and also at a neighboring grid point x minus delta x on the other side, with delta x being the distance between two grid points. We're going to restrict ourselves to a 1D uh, situation here. So write down these uh, Taylor series up until terms involving the third derivative. So pause the video and come back when you have these uh, Taylor series. Okay, let's have a go. So we have f of x plus delta x. Um, thanks to Taylor, that's equal to f of x. And then the second term is delta x, the derivative in the point x that, that we're studying. Uh, but in order to save some space, I'm not going to write down the, the argument here. Divided by one factorial, that's just one. And then we have delta x squared for a uh, second term. And then we have f prime evaluated at the central point x divided by two factorial. And then we have delta x cubed. So in order to be really accurate and to make sure that there's no confusion, I should actually write down uh, parentheses like these. So it's delta x cubed, not delta x cubed, okay, divided by 3 factorial and then f, and then we have the third uh, order derivative. We can keep on going forever, uh, but the important part is that if we stop here, the errors that we make by dropping all of the, the higher order terms will scale with delta x to the fourth. So if you half uh, the grid size here, then the error you, you make by stopping at this point will scale by a factor 2 to the, the power of 4. So this symbol here, this, this O, this order, is a very important symbol when you're constructing numerical approximations because that will be important in figuring out what the influence is of the grid size on the error. So how is the, the scaling of the error with respect to the, uh, to the grid size? Cool. Now let's do the same thing for the other side. That's f of x minus delta x. So that's going to be f of x minus, so it's just the same formula, but with some minus signs thrown in for good measure, for example, here. Okay, and again, I'm not going to write the parentheses in the delta x terms. Also, when we're talking about the order, just to save some uh, space on the notation. 
Okay, so now we have two things to work with. We have a, a first equation, which I'm going to call one, and a second equation, which I'm going to call two. Will these help us to calculate finite difference approximations to the derivatives? Obviously, the, the answer is yes. And I suggest we have a look at the first equation and you um, pause the video and calculate an approximation for the first derivative here and you drop all of the higher order terms. So see if you can figure out what the approximation is in that, in that case. And also, more importantly, see if you can figure out how the errors that you make scales as a function of dx. So pause the video and come back when you have the answer. Okay, so here we have our uh, f prime. So the way we then extract that from that formula, if we drop all the higher order stuff, is bring uh, this thing to the left-hand side and then divide everything by delta x. So that means that we can write that f prime is f of x plus delta x minus f of x, and then we divide by delta x. That's pretty straightforward. That, of course, smells a lot like the definition of derivative if you take the limit of delta x going towards zero. So that comes as no surprise. Now, how about the order of the approximation here? Well, you might be tempted to say, since we've dropped the, the second order here, that this thing scales as delta x squared. However, that's not really true uh, because, okay, in this equation, there's delta x squared. But remember, if we go to that equation, we have divided everything by delta x. So the error, therefore, is not delta x squared, but delta x. So what we've constructed here is the so-called forward difference approximation. Why is it called a forward difference approximation? Because we calculate f prime of x in dx, uh, sorry, f prime of x in x. And for that, we incorporate information looking towards the future looking forward, namely information from x plus uh, delta x. So this is the forward different approximation, which is first order accurate. Just for fun, pause the video and do the same thing with equation two and see what you have in that case. In that case, you have something extremely similar, but in that case, you get a so-called backwards difference approximation where you uh, don't look towards the future, but you nostalgically look towards the past. Namely, you have f of x uh, minus delta x in your formula, but otherwise it looks the same and it still has the same scaling behavior with respect to uh, delta x. Okay. So we know about the approximation error. It scales linearly as delta x. The question is, can we do something clever such that we have a more accurate approximation of our derivative? Well, so far we've just used either the first equation or the second equation. But what would happen if you use information from both equa equations? So pause the video and see if you can get another approximation of f prime, but this time by subtracting equation one from equation two. So what happens if you have equation one minus equation two? So pause the video to do that calculation. So if you're going to subtract these two equations, then a number of terms will cancel. So first of all, we will not have a term in uh, f of x that will cancel. But more importantly for our purposes is that this term here with f prime and delta x squared, that term will also cancel. And that's the first term of the error, uh, which we now have eliminated. That means that the error now does not scale as this term, but rather that term will be important for determining the order of the error. So that's, uh, that's good news. That will lead to a more accurate approximation. So let's do the calculation if we uh, subtract uh, these things. So that means that now we have f prime equal to f of x plus delta x minus f of x minus delta x. 
that term will cancel. Here we have uh, not delta x, but two delta x. So we divide by two delta x. Also makes a lot of sense uh, because uh, the difference here now between these two guys is two delta x. So that's fine. But now in terms of the order, so the delta x squared term that has cancelled. So now we have delta x cubed, but we still need to divide by a delta x in order to end up here. So now the upshot is that this thing will scale as delta x squared. So that's uh, good news, because now if we, for example, halve the grid size, then the error will not divide by 2, like in this case, but it will divide by 4 with hardly any extra numerical effort. It's just the same number of subtractions and divisions as in these formulas. So obviously this is not called the forward difference or the backward difference approximation, but in this case a central difference. Why central? Obviously because the point you're interested in uh, is central uh, with respect to the two other points that you use to calculate the, uh, the approximation. And this thing turns out to be a lot more accurate. You can figure out that it's more accurate based on this analysis and based on these terms that are cancelling, but you can also see that graphically that this is indeed something that will give you a much more accurate approximation. If you just have an exaggerated example here of x and a function uh, f of x that looks like this, and let's say here we have our point x, this is x minus delta x, and here we have x plus delta x. Now what we're interested in is the derivative at the point x. So that's basically the, the slope of the tangent here. So how can we approximate that using our three formulas? Well, for the first formula, the forward difference, there you basically take information from x and x plus delta x. So you linearize your function that way by drawing a line between these two points here. And that will result in the forward difference. If you look back at the definition of forward difference, the way we calculated that, that indeed corresponds to the slope here of these two, two lines here, because that's the ratio which is expressed by, uh, by, by that formula over here. Likewise, for the backward difference, uh, you have the slope of this line here. So that's, that's quite, quite different. Um, but for the central difference is that now you draw a line between x minus delta x and x plus delta x and you get this thing over here. So I guess even with my crappy drawing it's very easy to see that the central difference here, that line of all the three lines that we've approximated, the central difference one is the closest to the real derivative that we're trying to, to approximate. So visually you can see that and it also makes a lot of sense the reason why it is much more accurate is because we just take into account much more information here not only are we looking purely towards the past or purely towards the future no we're taking information into account both from the past and from the future and more information means more accurate uh, results good so now we've said everything we need to say about the first order derivative but what about f double prime how would you calculate that well if we go back to our two equations here equation one and equation two uh, pause the video and see if we can also extract the second derivative from that so perhaps not by subtracting the equations but perhaps what would happen if you add these equations so pause the video to figure out. So what happens if you add these two equations, then the f prime term will cancel because we're not interested in that. We want to calculate the next one here, which is the f double prime term. So that one we can now calculate by adding these two guys. So if we add this thing here, then we have two times f of x. And we bring that to the other side. And then if you also uh, look at what's going on, well, let me just write down the, the formula and, uh, and see what happens. So f double prime of x could be approximated by f of, f of x plus delta x and then minus 2 f of x plus f of x 
minus delta x. Um, and then let's see what we need to divide by. So if you look at the prefactors here, we're dividing um, by delta x squared. So two times half of delta x squared is just delta x squared. Okay. And then we have the, the order. So let's take a look at what's happening. So this thing will cancel. And the next guy will be order of delta x to the power of 4. But remember, we're dividing everything by delta x squared. So 4 minus 2 means that this is also a second order accurate formula for the second order derivative. So finite difference approximation of f double prime, which is a useful component for your replacement when you want to, for example, discretize um, the, the Helmholtz equation. By the way, when we're looking at this formula, we can also gain a little bit more insight into the geometry behind that approximation. If we write that, for example, uh, and then let's forget about some, some scaling factors, but we can write down that equation as f of x plus delta x plus f of x minus delta x divided by 2 minus f of x. So I've just eliminated the, this thing over here and then I've divided everything by 2 and then rearranged things a little bit. But if you write it like that, and we can clearly see that what we have in this first uh, term here, that's basically the average of the function f in its surroundings here at x. So it's the average between f of x plus and minus delta x. So the second order derivative is basically the difference between that average and the value of the function at the point itself that you want to calculate. So that's the geometrical interpretation behind the second order derivative or the, the Laplacian, if you want. And you can also easily see that in a drawing. So say you have a function which has a certain point where the second order derivative is, uh, is zero, as you can see in this example. So there you can clearly see if you calculate what's going on here. If you calculate the average of that, that function in its surroundings, so that's basically the difference between a point like this and a point like that. And then if you subtract that average from the value at the point that you're interested in, you basically end up with, with zero. So this again illustrates that uh, this is a sensible way of looking at the uh, geometrical interpretation of the second order derivative.